In her 2006 publication, Participation, art historian, critic, author and professor Claire Bishop regards participatory art as being motivated by three main agendas, activation, authorship and community. Activation concerns the desire to create an active subject, one who will be empowered by the experience of participation in the hope that they will find themselves able to determine their own social and political reality. Participatory art concerned with authorship brings into question the authority of the artist as author of the work. By surrendering some or all of the control, it's regarded as more egalitarian and democratic than the creation of the work by a single artist and shared production benefits aesthetically from a greater risk and unpredictability. The third agenda involves a perceived crisis in community and collective responsibility, which stems from the isolating effects of capitalism. One of the main motivations behind participatory art has therefore been to restore social bonds. So these three categories, activation, authorship and community, Obviously, participatory art doesn't fit neatly into just one of these categories. They can also be overlapping. Um, but I've decided to group the artists based on these three categories, um, keeping in mind that there is obviously some overlap between them. Two notable artists who work to establish important precedents for participatory art are Brazilian artists Ligia Clark and Helio Oichisica. Both of these artists were originally influenced by Brazil's constructivist movement of the 1950s, but quickly moved beyond geometric paintings and sculptures to works that engaged the audience's full body and senses. Clark's participatory creations spanned nearly three decades. The rich interactive vocabulary she developed with objects made from very simple materials began with a series of bichos, or animals, created from 1960 to 1964. These sculptures are hinged metal plates that could be manipulated by the viewer to create various shapes. They required active participation in order to reveal their organic nature and unfold their multiple configurations. The bichos are fundamentally unstable structures. They question the physical certainty of the user as they are at all moments at the brink of collapsing. They don't have an ideal shape. They don't have front and back. They are fully manipulable and they unfold as potential multiplicities, structurally as well as organically. These objects have no defined front, back, inside or outside. What do you think the metaphorical significance of this is? Pause here to discuss her work. Clark began as a geometric abstract painter, but gradually became more and more interested in collapsing the inside and the outside, and the front and the back, the kinds of things that normally we take for granted with a two-dimensional picture plane. So she began by making foldable sculptures, essentially. A work like this, which looks in many cases, like it could be displayed on the wall, but was in fact meant to be opened, folded, and reconfigured by her audience into a range of different shapes, all of which could move and none of which remain static. There is no right way to show this sculpture because there is no front, there is no back. Likewise, there's no inside or outside. That Lack of distinction, in some sense, parallels Clark's own obsession throughout her life with death and trying to imagine it. In that sense, what looks like a small metal sculpture, and is, in fact, ties into larger existential issues that she was grappling with. Clark's experiences tend to merge the body's interior and exterior spaces, stressing the direct connection between the body's physical and psychological dimensions. The work is constantly redefined by each participant. Clark's apparently simple creations are, in fact, demanding propositions that ask viewers to infuse the work with their lives and energy. Clark was never concerned with self-expression in art, but instead with the possibility of self-discovery, experimentation, invention and transformation. Consider these concepts. Does art necessarily need to include self-expression? Can it just be an invitation for the audience 
to engage in some sort of process of self-discovery or transformation. The beachons remain formally beautiful objects and many are displayed today with the attached label, do not touch. Clark, however, emphasising the importance of the viewer's experience, abandoned the production of art objects altogether to enter a sensorial phase of her work with her Nostalgia of the Body series, starting around 1964. Her hoods, masks, goggles, gloves, suits and other objects made of readily available materials provided viewers with experiences that sometimes constrain and sometimes enhance the various senses to activate new connections between them. Clark's gloves, for instance, are made of various materials, sizes and textures. The gloves aim at rediscovery of touch. Participants use the many combinations of gloves and balls of different sizes, textures and weights, and then hold the balls again with their bare hands. In these works, viewer participation becomes the focus of attention, while the object remains secondary, existing only in order to promote a sensorial or relational experience. After 1968, these works developed into collective body works, Clark titled Organic or Ephemeral Architectures. In the last phase of her work, lasting from approximately 1979 until her death in 1988, Clark moved even further from traditional definitions of art and artist, employing a vocabulary of relational objects for the purposes of emotional healing. Objects made of simple materials such as plastic bags, stones, air, shells, water, sand, styrofoam, fabric and nylon stockings acquired meaning only in relation to the participants. Continuing to approach art experimentally, Clark made no attempt to establish boundaries between therapeutic practice and artistic experience, and was even less concerned with preserving her status as an artist. The physical sensations caused by the relational objects were an attempt to awaken the body's latent memory and aid in emotional healing. So think about this. Are these works art or are they therapy? Where is the, the line between the two and at, at what point is this line crossed by the artist? Through his work, Helio Oichisika challenged the traditional boundaries of art and its relationship with life, undermining the separation of the art object from the viewer whom he turned into an active participant. From his early explorations of colour and light, Oichisika increasingly encouraged audience participation culminating in his parangols, a slang word meaning a situation of sudden confusion or excitement. Literally wearable paintings, they were designed to be worn while dancing to the rhythm of samba. They came out of his involvement with the people of Manguera Hill, a Rio de Janeiro shantytown, and Manguera's famous samba school. The parangols represent the culmination of Oichisika's efforts to encourage the viewer's interaction with the artwork and to liberate colour into a three-dimensional space. Parangola is a work that you can wear, most known by the capes, because the capes the people wear to dance, to perform, and is a work that works very much with the body. What you, you're going to see here is the way he brought this color from the objects to the people's lives. So how do Oichisika's parangolas activate the viewer? Pause here and discuss what you think. And, and normal people that Want to, wanting to join to, to the parade, to this event, they will be invited to participate. When people perform Parangolé, they are living the color. I think the most significant lesson of the Parangolé is, you know, the spirit of liberty. Because when you start to play, you become kind of child. So you begin to discover a liberty of your soul through this work, which is incredible. Tania Bruguera uses her politically motivated performance art to examine the social effects of political and economic power. 
Her works often take the form of collaborations with institutions and individuals, staging participatory events and interactions that build on her own observations, experiences, and interpretations of the politics of repression and control. Bruguera's work is multifaceted and spans performance, event, action, film, installation, writing, and teaching, alongside site-specific works, including Taitlin's Whisper No. 5 and Surplus Value. Taitlin's Whisper No. 5 was performed in 2008. Visitors arrived at the Great Hall of the Tate Modern in London, only to encounter two mounted policemen directing the audience around the space. Using the skills they acquired as mounted officers, they moved the crowd from one side to another, clearing certain areas or pathways, although with no specific crowd control goals to be accomplished. You have these police who are coming towards you and giving you direction of what to do, where to move, if you have to stand or you have to move somewhere. And they're using actually the horses to make this happen, uh, like they usually do in their everyday job. In what way does this work by Bruguera remind you of Vito Conchi's following piece, Maria Bramovich and Ulai's? Imponderabilia and Vali Export's Tap and Touch Cinema. Pause here, Marta, and discuss any possible connections or associations you can make between these works. Perhaps one example of a connection could be the fact that uh, two of the three works, Tap and Touch Cinema and Following Piece, both brought art out of the gallery and into the public space, whereas this work by Bruguera does the opposite in a way. It brings the public space into the gallery. Potentially another connection you might have made is issues of audience participation and consent. While visitors at the Tate have certainly entered the space anticipating an art experience, Taitlin's Whisper is not clearly announced as a performance, nor, once the audience is under the policeman's authority, can participation said to be truly voluntary. That people do not have to know that it's art. And for me this is very important because, because once you know it's art, then you start, you can do other associations that are not exactly what you will do in your everyday life. So the fact that they're using uh, and, and having the same reaction they have in real life when they see the police controlling them, uh, for me is very important. I am uh, working uh, in a way in which I like people not to think it's art so they can really enjoy it as a live event and not as a representation of a live event. So what purpose do you think Bruguera's performance serves? Why do you think it's important that the audience experiences the work as a lived event rather than as an artistic representation? Instead of presenting images that can be viewed at a safe distance, she wants people to personally experience the dynamics of power. Performance art has the unique power of being able to activate viewers and invite them to become part of the artwork, giving them a sense of power they might not otherwise experience in a gallery setting. But in this case, Bruguera has turned performance art on its head, and instead of empowering her audience, she intentionally makes them feel disempowered. This is the fifth piece in the series, Taitlin's Whisper. This series intends to activate images, well known because of having been repeatedly seen in the press, but are here decontextualized from the original event that gave way to the news and staged as realistically as possible in an art institution. The most important element in this series is the participation of spectators who may determine the course the piece will take. The idea is that next time spectators face a piece of news using similar images to those they experienced, they may feel an individual empathy with that distant event toward which they would normally have an attitude of emotional disconnection or informative saturation. The experience of the audience within the piece may allow them to understand information in a different way and appropriate it because of having lived through it. Bruguera's 2012 work at the Tate Modern, Surplus Value, participants were required to wait in line for an extended amount of time, 
and then randomly selected into those who could enter the work and those who were submitted to a lie detector test concerning visa applications in order to highlight the problems of immigration. Have you ever deliberately overstayed a visa? No. Have you ever been asked to leave a country for any reason? No. There is also a little um, detail, which is the people who are in charge of taking care of the queue uh, from the museum have the authorization to enter people randomly. You can be lucky and uh, be privileged in a way. Once you enter the space, so it's a maximum maybe five, six people at a time, it is um, a reproduction of a historical object that was stolen a few years ago in the Auschwitz concentration camp. There were four of these signs. The first one was done in Dachau, and it was done in 36, three years after the opening of the camp. The camp was a labor first, then concentration, then extermination. The B is inverted. And it was a gesture the prisoner who made it did in purpose. A very tiny rebellious moment where he wanted to make something imperfect, where perfection was the rule and where perfection was the way to go. Officers were so arrogant they never saw this. But the prisoners were seeing this as a little very small hope Surplus Value was part of a long-term project lasting from 2006 to 2015 titled Immigrant Movement International, an artist-initiated socio-political movement that was originally presented by Creative Time in collaboration with the Queen's Museum of Art. Engaging both local and international communities, as well as working with social service organisations, elected officials and artists focused on immigration reform, Bruguera examined growing concerns about the political representation and conditions facing immigrants. By engaging the local community through public workshops, events, actions and partnerships with immigrant and social service organisations, Immigrant Movement International explored who is defined as an immigrant and the values they share, focusing on the larger question of what it means to be a citizen of the world. Suzanne Lacey's career as an artist, educator and activist spans multiple decades and offers one of the most important models we have of a practice that explores complex social dynamics and political issues while never losing sight of art as a source of imagination and as a catalyst of change. Judy Chicago and Alan Capra acted as mentors early in her career and she is motivated by an ongoing awareness of the vulnerability of individuals living in marginalised communities. Using conversation as her principal medium, she acts primarily as a communicator, one who can bring others together, if only to voice their differences in transformative ways. The Crystal Quilt is one of several works by Lacey that explores the experience of ageing and in this case, how the media portrays ageing and what the role for older people in the public is. The project was developed over a two-year period from 1985 to 87, during which Lacey created a series of events and classes, including a lecture series, film screenings, and a mass media campaign in collaboration with almost two dozen artists and scores of volunteers. The work culminated in a large-scale performance installation on Mother's Day in 1987, the performance featured three, 430 Minnesota women over the age of 60, seated at tables designed to resemble a quilt. On Mother's Day in 1987, we took over this very large shopping complex that's at the center of the city. And the ceiling of this building is crystalline glass. So the crystal quilt was a reflection Over 3,000 people came to witness the performance. There were 430 performers. They came from all over the state. These performers came into the quilt, and as they sat down, they unfolded the tablecloths, which were constructed to start black and then reveal 
the colors of the red and the yellow. As they sit down at the tables, they begin to have these sort of sculpted conversations framed loosely around key questions that have been identified by older women participants. One thing I think is important to mention is that these weren't questions about the past. They were questions about the present time and the future, and that was very important to me that we didn't see these older women as potential, you know, reservoirs of memory, um, but as potential activists within the public sphere. Every 15 minutes or so, they would hear a sound go out across the entire space that would signal women to change the positions of their hands. So from above, it looked like stitches on a quilt changing. To commemorate the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women in 2010, Lacey made the Tattooed Skeleton, a multi-part installation that took over a year of working in Madrid, filming in a shelter for battered women and cooperating with the Ministry of Health and Social Policy to critically examine how media and official political discourse construct narratives of gender violence and the effectiveness of these narratives in the public domain. The project began with a white mask that protesters in Spain have used to symbolise how victims of domestic violence must remain hidden for fear of retribution. The project embraced the complexities of this symbol, which also provoked feelings of entrapment and helplessness for abused women. 400 personal narratives from women around the country were recorded by hand onto the face of the white masks that were used throughout the project. Yo a veces pienso, yo porque tengo que estar aquí, porque me tengo que esconder, es que no es normal, porque todas estamos aquí escondidas y ellos siguen en la calle. Esa es la pregunta que yo siempre me hago, y yo porque tengo que estar aquí y yo porque tengo que salir de mi casa y yo porque tengo que ir a un juicio a interrogándome como si fuera una delincuente. Si yo estoy contando mi verdad, que la mayor ni la mitad se la creen. Pero una persona que, que te pega, te, te pone el, su pie aquí en el, en, el, en, en el suelo, te coge y te arrastra. Un par de veces sí tiene algún morado en los brazos, en la pierna, pero claro, yo los tapaba. El maltrato psicológico, como digo, fue tan duro. No sé cómo una persona puede tener tanto argumento para hacer daño. Me dijo calva, me dijo la cara desfigurada. Calva, me dijo calva. Las cuadras me vi el pelo que tenía calvas. Manojo que me había arrancado el pelo. So how do these works by Lacey represent activation as a category of participatory art? Think back to what we were talking about before, um, about activation as empowering subjects of participation to determine their own social and political reality. Lacey has stated, in some sense, the Crystal Quilt was, success was successful politically in that the work was bigger, it had more social impact in that region, but do one or two events ever change the way people, other than those who directly experience it, see? This raises the issue of whether you can expect art to create social change, and at what point is it no longer art? For an activist like Lacey, the goal is to convert the participation of a few selected individuals into broader social change. Lacey remains hopeful that through audience participation, her work can reach beyond the walls of a conventional museum or the traditional expectations for an art object. In her words, I have discovered that this kind of project can galvanise conversation. I'm interested in whether it can change public policy. <laughs>